You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. And welcome to Spookulative Evolution. Hello, David. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> well, this, this is the first one that I thought that might be what I, <laughs> where I had a guess. <laughs> And hello, listeners. Welcome to the last episode of 2020 Spooky. The final installment of our Sea Monsters series of Spookulative Evolution. Absolutely. And as typical, we leave the weirdest for last. We did Kraken. Kraken. We did Sea Serpents. Yeah. We did the Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And now... The Sirens. So at this year, we've been doing Sea Monsters, but Spooky is a tradition we do every year for October, Halloween... And we look at some of our favorite and the most famous and noteworthy monsters and creatures and weird mythical things and see what could we do with that concept and normal real world natural selection and evolution. And when those two combine, what do we end up with? Right. It's an opportunity for us to flex our biological thinking muscles. Mm -hmm. And see if we can use the building blocks and tools of real world evolution to produce an endpoint that approximates a chosen monster. That would get someone to go, oh, okay, yeah, I guess that's that. <laughs> <laughs> For fun. For fun. This and is... also to, to give us an opportunity to think up as many weird real life creatures and evolutionary things as we can. To add to the spooky verse. This episode, we are doing the Sirens. A very famous group of creatures. Yeah, this is going back to Greek mythology, so... A little bit of a callback to yeah. last year. So the Sirens, for anyone who doesn't know what they are, are typically represented as female monsters or beings or creatures, but typically female. Yeah, feminine in their appearance and behavior. Yeah, that are known to be on, there's there's actually debate on which islands they're supposed to be on, but islands mm -hmm. around Greek waters <laughs> that sing in such beautiful tones or about such beautiful things that when sailors hear them, they are compelled to go toward the sirens often running their ships up onto the rocks and sinking them and then drowning at sea. Right. And so that's kind of the classic tale is the sirens are a threat to sailors because, not because they're attacking them, but because their songs are so alluring, they veer off course into danger. Right. And they make John Turturro insist on pulling the car over and then he gets turned into a toad. Yep. He loved him up and turned him into a horny toad. <laughs> And so that's the concept, is that they are just alluring. Now, the history of the sirens is actually a, quite a bit different than how they're often portrayed in modern media, like Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? That's a very different siren than what they were originally. So sirens, uh, the name typically means or is typically translated to as binder or entangler. Ooh. And that's as they are binding men with their song or entrancing and tangling with the magic of their voices. In Greek mythology, they show up in a few different stories, but the one that is typically pointed to as like, this is where we first see sirens, is Homer's Odyssey, the Odyssey, where Odysseus is trying to, you know, leave the Battle of Troy and has all sorts of really wacky adventures along the way. One of which involves the witch, the sea witch. I've I always used to hear it Circe. Uh, mm -hmm. It's Kirky. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. I the the monstrum video. She said Kirky, and I looked it up on Wikipedia. Sure enough, the witch Kirky, when they leave her island, she advises them: beware of the sirens. The way you can survive them is to have all your men stuff their ears with wax. Right, so they can't hear. So they can't hear the sirens, but. And saying to Odysseus, if you want to hear the siren song, have your men tie you to the mast of the ship. Right. And then they do that. They go by the sirens. All the men stuff their ears with wax. Odysseus ties himself up. Right. So he can't leave. So that he cannot leave. So that he is trapped on the ship. And as soon as he hears the siren, starts begging his men to untie him. Mm -hmm. So that he can go to the sirens. They do not. They all make it past. And the Odyssey continues. It's a good crew. But... 
There are a couple of notable things about the sirens in this earliest of stories. One, they don't say... They, they do allude to them being feminine, but they don't say that they're, like, enticing him with with romantic times and, like, promises of... of Intimacy. Uh, intimacy, thank you. <laughs> they actually say that the songs are promising secrets and singing of the knowledge they hold of the world and the secrets of the universe. Oh, that interesting. Their songs are about how enticing their knowledge is, and that's what he's tempted by. Not by the women that are singing, right? Right. It's not a. It's not a sexual thing. Exactly. It's more of a about s- lore or greatness or or powerful yeah, well, information. Yes, powerful information, secrets, right, in, right. and uh, 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 important knowledge. And the other thing is, there is not a single description of what they look like. Okay. In the original text, there is no description. It's only in other artworks that. The Sirens got their first physical descriptions, which was not what we picture as beautiful women standing on the rocks singing to the sailors a lot of the time. It was bird women. Okay, yeah, I have seen that. Mm -hmm. That's the most common form that the Sirens take, is actually bird women. Now, we did some bird women back in the Greek episode. We did harpies last year. We did harpies. Now, harpies were a bit different, where these were like either winged women or bird-like women that were monstrous and attacking you with talons these typically are shown as birds with women's heads or women that are human from the head to the waist and then have a bird like centaur style lower body interesting and then there are some where it's just a woman with bird-like features but no wings Mm -hmm. and then Every now and then, just winged women. Like harpies, basically. Yeah, just, or even more just like angelic. Just like oh, oh, I see. wings slapped on. Hmm. So it's various, but most commonly, it's either birds with women's heads or birds with women's torsos where their head would be. And that's what the sirens are, are these bird women that live out at sea and sing to sailors. Now, there's been some differences as to the group because it's always a group. But in Homer's original, that he only referenced two. Mm-hmm. And then later on, most typically, it's referenced three sirens. And so once again, we're dealing with not like sirens are a danger of the oceans. It's there are three sirens. They live on these islands. And they are a danger if you pass by them. Right. You know, they were... And they've been given various names. So I don't have a list of the names. But they were like... They, these were three individuals. And there were no more sirens than that. Okay. So th- this is, again, kind of like the Hydra, kind of like the Leviathan. Yeah. The Sirens. But in some older arts and texts, there were both male and female Sirens. So there used to be kind of just more of like a race of... Right, a community. A of community. Sorts. And then it became just the three and just female. So that's typically what you hear. Now, there are some other classic stories about the Sirens. Jason and the Argonauts also encounter the Sirens, and in their situation, they survive the Sirens in a very different way, which is they have Orpheus on their ship, who is a character in Greek stories and is known for his minstrel abilities. He is a musician of, like, godly proportions, and when he hears the Sirens start singing, he just sings over them (laughs) and his song is so much better than theirs that none of the sailors are tempted right he drowns it out he drowns it out oh that's fun right so you can have a sing-off with the sirens (laughs) and survive them but in certain versions of these stories uh particularly in the odyssey in another one called hyginus's fable it's stated that if a mortal survives their song or resists their song the sirens will kill themselves out of anguish huh they they can't take being bested right right and so in one version of the story with odysseus when they pass by with the wax in their ears the sirens then throw themselves into the sea Hmm. because they their song didn't work which is i I, that's it doesn't seem like that's in every version of the stories but yeah but interesting there are some there was one quote that was saying they are fated to die if anyone should survive their singing. Right, right. So 
that's a weird quirk. Yeah. It's it's it, to me that feels very much like the old fable or the a video game even of like and here's how you beat this boss. Right. This is the secret. This is the secret. Well, and it and it it allows you to defeat them without having to engage them in combat yeah in the classic style yeah it's, it's it's this is the version of cutting the hydra's heads and searing the stumps mm-hmm. surviving their song is all you actually need to do now sirens have been in stories since greek times and been in artwork very uh commonly and over time that their, their appearance has changed in some ways that might seem more familiar so they started off originally as bird women period but as time went on, some of them started getting more fishy-like traits. In this Monstrum episode about sirens, they show one picture where one of them almost seems to have like a duck or goose bird body. Interesting. Where it's webbed feet and some of the feathers look kind of scaly. Huh. And the tail looks maybe kind of flippery. By the 7th century, there was a description of them that said they were women from the heads to navels, belly button, and instead of legs had fish tails. So at that point... They were mermaids. Mermaids. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Which we've also done uh, in our first ever speculative yes. uh, episode after episode 39. That was a but we digress. That was before spooky. Yeah. So that's the the origins of us getting to do this yep, stuff. The pre spooky. And in the Middle Ages, they were still very much pictured as mermaids, mer people. But there were other descriptions in the 10th century in and in a Byzantine encyclopedia. There was one description I found that said, from their chests up, sirens have the form of sparrows, and below they were women. Huh. So they flipped it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or alternatively, they're little birds with women's faces. Right. Weird. Uh, yeah. So there's been a bunch of different versions. Typically, they're bird women, but at some point, they got connected with mermaids. Right. Which makes sense. And that has been, at least what from what I've seen most commonly in modern stuff, that's now... In our current day uh, mythology, how sirens are typically portrayed is women of the ocean, right? Who are singing, and I, I there is a movie I think called Siren, and it's a mermaid, where it's a horror movie, a monster movie, and I know I've seen it in other things where sirens have taken the form of mermaids. Huh. Well, and also siren is the name taxonomically given. To manatees. Yep. The Sirenians. Which are heavily connected with the myth of the mermaid. Yep. So t- in the modern day, you know, in the last couple hundred years, really sirens have just sh- completely flipped mm-hmm. what we picture them as to the point where now they also can just be represented as beautiful women. And now it's become much more about them being alluring and voluptuous or, you know, enticing because they are women, and less so just about their song being enchanting. Because right. in the old stories, it wasn't that they were going, hey there, sailor, come over here. It was just, my song is so beautiful, the music itself is hypnotic. Right. That's it. So what we typically picture sirens nowadays is, is very different. Yeah. Interesting. So it sounds like, and this is something we haven't brought up yet this year's Spooky, although we've brought it up in the past. Mm -hmm. There is in some versions of the story a magical quality to the song. Absolutely. So perhaps before we wrap up Spooky 2020, uh, it may be time for the patented magic disclaimer. Absolutely. And that actually reminds me before we did the disclaimer that to back up their magical origins, the sirens typically are, have a story for their origins. Oh, uh, that I almost forgot about. One is that they are the daughters of either the sea god Phorcys or the river god Achelos. And typically with their mother being one of the muses who are the gods of art and inspiration. Right. The narrators from Hercules. Exactly. And so a lot of times they are shown to be of godly origin, that they are either gods or demigods. Right. Depending on how you weigh things, I guess. Others have a story that they were the handmaidens or companions of Persephone, Mm -hmm. who, as many of you may recognize the name, goes on to become the wife of Hades when she is trapped or tricked into staying into the underworld and becoming his bride. And when that happens, 
they become distraught and go seeking her, and when they can't find her, they beseech the gods to give them wings so that they can escape their their mourning. Hmm. And in those versions of the story, they gods granted their wish, they gave them wings, and they became the sirens. In slightly other different versions of the story, the goddess Demeter punished them for failing Persephone and turned them into the sirens. Gotcha. So... It's varied origins. Varied origins, varied body forms, varied looks. And yeah, they definitely, they have godly origins. They have their magic voice. And this does give, bring us to the point where we have to make our magic disclaimer in saying that there are certain things, abilities, attributes, qualities that monsters are often given that are outside the abilities of the natural world that just... You can't get make an animal or plant actually do those things and it obey physics and not have robotic parts. Right. Like, <laughs> there are just some things we can't evolve. So we will always try to get as close as we can to many of the things, but there are some things we just have to kind of push aside or accept a substitution for because we can't always right. achieve them well it's like in the, the past couple episodes you know we mentioned the kraken was described in some cases as miles long yes so, okay yeah we're not quite gonna go to that extent so in this case our evolutionary task is to figure an origin an evolutionary history for these possibly alluring possibly feminine singing sea island creatures yeah so kind of our our common trends they are always associated with the ocean yep they are aquatic mm -hmm. or at least on the shore right i i it, it did strike me as interesting that the one story described them as destroying themselves by throwing yeah. themselves into the sea drowning themselves which suggests that they can drown yes that's exactly what it was is they drowned themselves right so because most of the time in the stories they're on the rocks not in the water right exactly so but they are ocean you know adjacent at least they are typically most of the time female mm -hmm. they always are singing yep so singing is always part of it right there in the name Sometimes their goal is to kill sailors, uh, right. but other times it just happens to right. attract. They just lead them to ruin. Yeah, and it's happenstance, but it's always that their song draws. Right. It is always an attraction. And then we get into whether the how sexy they are, yeah. you know, <laughs> or how mermaid or bird they are. Typically, they were bird-like. More recently, they were mermaid-like. Right. So my first thought in terms of where to put these on a on a tree of life mm -hmm. is to think about groups of animals that are highly vocal. Yes. Now, birds... Birds are great for that. Obviously are a great choice. Uh, my first thought early on was cetaceans. Yep, yep. Whales and dolphins are very vocal yes. uh, creatures. Uh, amphibians are very vocal. True. Although harder to get an amphibian in the middle of the ocean, yes, no, not quite as, uh, as as want to do that as uh, uh, birds and cetaceans. Insects are very noisy in many cases. Although I don't know that we're going to get a bug person. Yeah, well, and, and both insects and amphibians are very noisy, but neither sound like singing. This is true. They are they're noises. Well, they're also, chirping and trilling. Yeah, in insects aren't making noises with their voices. Mm -mm. Frogs do. Frogs yes. are actually, they have resonation uh, with their voice, which I suspect uh, we might end up with these sirens creating something that can resonate, something yeah. that can amplify that sound. But then the other thought that, that, that I was thinking is if we have the, the sound, uh, we got to figure out this music, right? Yes. What in our real life siren would draw people in? And that's that's where my brain was first going. Mm -hmm. And I I had an immediate thought when I was taking notes for the sirens is their bird women is the most common. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about birds and the first bird that came to mind was the lyre bird. I had the same thought. Yep. Or uh, parrots was yes. the other thought yep. I had. So uh, parrots famously mimic and mock 
people's voices and other sounds. But the lyrebird is a bird of paradise that's very famous for stealing other birds' calls for its own display. And it is so good at mimicking that it'll also do, like, sounds from the local town, like car noises and, you know, chainsaw noises from people cutting down trees. And uh, the there was one with that David Attenborough where it was a camera shutter yep. of them taking pictures of it. Yeah, if you don't know what a lyre bird is, go to the YouTube mm-hmm. lyre, like the, the instrument, L Y R E. Look up a video of lyre bird. It'll probably be that David Attenborough because it's clip awesome. and it's fantastic. And so I was thinking of them, and if you have a mimicking animal, yeah, if you have a mimicking bird, now I can sound like. You know, I can do all sorts of things. I could sound like a woman. Yeah. You know, I could sound like someone in distress or something. That, which is what my first idea was, is like, if you're out at sea and you, and they are mimicking the sound of someone calling for help. Yeah. You know, you're going to assume someone's stuck in the water. Yes. I had that thought, but, and also the, the, the note of them, uh, uh bringing people in with knowledge mm-hmm, mm-hmm. also made me think that, well, they could be, if they're mimicking people, they could be repeating things. Yes, yeah. You know, and it could be you're hearing someone that sounds like they're in distress or you're hearing what sounds like a broadcast mm-hmm. being put out or something like that where they have picked up this the these noises and if they're communal, yep. lyre birds and lots of other birds will develop their songs mm-hmm. so they will the, the songs can change each yeah. individual will have their own unique combination of sounds yeah they'll constantly be adding new parts to the song because the whole point is to try to make your song stand out from all the other lyrebirds so if you have our sirens whatever creatures they are if they're doing something similar they could not only be mimicking what they hear but each other mm-hmm. so it could be that you know a ship of people visited this island a hundred years ago. Yeah. And those vocal mi- imitations have just been being passed down generation after generation into yeah. this weird hodgepodge of imitation sounds. Oh, well, see, that just gave me an idea of like, so typically the sirens aren't the one that aren't the ones that do the killing. It's they bring you into the rocks or something. Mm -hmm. So there was one part of the, I I keep referencing the episode of Monstrum about Siren. Go to YouTube and look up Monstrum. And they have an awesome episode about Sirens where they go into the history of like the origins myth, you know, story wise way better. And it's awesome. But they mentioned that one of the ideas is that could have influenced the stories for Sirens were predatory birds at sea. Cause there's one description of the, siren's home or the rocks they're on being strewn with bones of the dead that have been lured by their song and they've referenced they were saying that that could be predatory birds living at sea with the bones of their prey around Mm -hmm. the nest you know from feeding fish to the babies and eating you know other small animals they catch is if we had these if our sirens were in a rocky place and a ship happened to crash there with all the shouting and yelling that goes along with a ship sinking, that's what they learn. And so now they have the sounds of a ship in distress <laughs> that then brings other ships and that get cast upon the rocks. Absolutely. So you have this one area where every time a ship goes by, suddenly it's man overboard. We're going down. And you, people are like, Oh, we need to go help. Well, and, and, If it's depending on how modern our sirens are, right, how modern our technology is, a ship might also have an actual siren Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on board to indicate to the crew like, hey, uh, danger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they could also be picking up actual siren sounds. Absolutely. Technological warnings and such. And now all of this is to say, like, because we're giving them lots of horrifying noises to make, Mm -hmm. uh, but they also still can make bird like very pretty beautiful bird noises so like they can still be the alluring songs of the sirens well but that there is also a insidious way they can use the songs or they could be picking it up from i mean if they're out at sea if they themselves are not whales and they hear whale songs right if if we're basically creating an ocean lyre bird exactly yeah the whale noises and dolphin noises and all sorts of uh sounds that they might be picking up out at sea Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
cool. I like that. Now, uh, obviously, the biggest driver of doing something like that is for mating. Yes. Right. You're singing a song. You want to be putting out a mating signal. And I think that that makes sense. I don't think that they, uh, unless we want them to be predatory and they're attracting other animals. Which yeah, I, I had thought of, you know, th- that there, I feel like there is potential for that idea that ca- casting ships upon the rock give you things to feed on once yep. either everyone's drowned or the fish that they were catching are available. But mating is definitely the more common use of stuff like that which then makes one wonder why would you have to be so loud yeah to which my response would be what if they live in a series of islands yeah exactly like and this you're is having communication to over the water between islands that they're they're in a patch of islands that maybe is resource limited maybe they have big territories or something but they are communicating across the ocean you have mm-hmm. to hear them from the next island over yeah not you know miles upon miles but there are animals today that can communicate surprisingly long distances i think uh, uh what is it? a lion or tiger's roar is supposedly audible over a, a mile or something yep, like yep. that so if you have fairly closely spaced islands or maybe large land masses where they're spread across that whole area well because then we could also make it apply to like establishing territory like it's attracting females but it's also letting the other you know sirens know hey this shore this coastline is is mine if if you're a male siren stay away right you know so it can and because then that also gives use for the volume like i want it to reach so that females can hear me from maybe one of the other islands but i also need it to reach to the boundaries of my territory right you know so now being loud is helpful in both regards here's another thought so it it sounds like we might be going with birds that's that's my vote my first thought was to come up with some sort of humanoid dolphins right right but birds seems to be the the direction we're going Mm -hmm. with so now i'm thinking okay but depictions of them describe them as vaguely human-like as typically at least having a human face if right. not like torso. Right, right, right. Or in some cases it sounds like human legs mm-hmm. with a bird head or some something that... most of the time though it's the face. Right. 99% of the time it is a woman's head, which makes me wonder if they need to be big. Yep. Do they need to be human sized? I was thinking decent size cuz we could have a, they could be like albatross, you know, like Right. Ocean going birds. I was actually thinking uh, originally, but uh, I was thinking, OK, well, there are seabirds. Mm-hmm. There are albatrosses and gannets and, and gulls who do live out at sea. I'm wondering if they live on islands, if this isn't an opportunity oh. to have flightless birds. Yeah. Have more penguin like something yeah, more penguin or or well, not a kiwi is a bad example yes. for something big. But, you know, something emu-like yeah. that has developed on a, a, a patch of islands, which, uh, uh, if they're communicating, makes it more sense to have several connected islands or mm-hmm. one relatively large island. If well, they're flightless, they can still travel. Yeah, I was going to say, if we make them swimming birds, they could still be on isolated islands. Oh, that's true. And there have been large, flightless swimming birds. Oh, yeah. There there have been several of them, but I know that there were, in the past, fossil record-wise, uh, I believe large flightless geese mm-hmm. on Hawaii. There's the Italian flightless duck. Yeah. I forget its name. But yeah, there have been a number of cases of shorebirds, seabirds, freshwater, various aquatic birds evolving relatively large sizes and flightlessness. Well, and, and we, like... Going back to penguins, the biggest penguin today is pretty decent size. And there were bigger penguins that like there were human sized penguins That's in true. the fossil record. And also not penguins. Yeah. So like the platopterids were mm-hmm. near uh, similar to penguins, but not quite penguins. So we could have a, a penguin esque animal that because then it's also standing upright. Yes. Like a person. It's got a through the mist at sea. Yeah. It would look like a person standing on the shore that has wings for arms. Ooh. Now, penguins are Southern Hemisphere. Yes. And this is Greek uh, uh, mythology, which is Northern. Mm-hmm. In the North, 
uh, the Plotopterids I was about to were say, up north. I thought they, I thought uh, they ranged that far. And also Ox. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, used to be up north. So there have been birds in the north that we could use. I mean, this doesn't have to be in Greece, but, I feel you know. like that, that lends some respect to the, to the history. Right, of yeah. right. We're keeping it relatively north. We put it in the Mediterranean. Yeah. No, I'm cool with a, a plot, Plotopterid or, or Ock-esque. Yeah. Now, I recently, I forget. So penguins are, I believe, closer to albatrosses and, and certain other seabirds. Whereas Plotopterids, I want to say we're more uh, near nearer to cormorants and gannets, maybe. They're on two different groups of, uh, two different parts of the bird family tree. I wouldn't know anything about that, Paul. But they are both uh, closely related to ocean-going aquatic birds. Yes. So this could be a separate group Yeah. Uh, that kind of spawned off of some variety of aquatic bird. Well, because once again, we're dealing with a, a feature that has been evolved multiple times. So, right. We could ha- we could uh, visit our old friend Convergent Evolution. That's true. And in terms of human-like faces, um, I'm trying to think of birds that eat large seeds mm-hmm. will mm-hmm. often get short beaks that are good for cracking. So I'm thinking like a parrot. Yeah. Oh, because I was thinking when we when we, you were bringing up the human features, parrot was what where I went to was a flat faced bird that would look a little bit more humanoid. Mm-hmm. And if we do go with like a seed cracking beak, they could be eating like shellfish. Oh, true. And cracking open shells. Yep. And so that could still make them very aquatic. I also really like the idea of going with some sort of penguiform bird. Because then when you get too close to the islands, they're all going to jump into the water. (laughs) They're going to cast themselves into the sea to avoid you. Yeah, well, penguins also, penguins do this. Ox, I believe, used to do this when we had them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of shorebirds will have communal nesting grounds. So you could easily end up with just this massive colony of extremely loud singing and calling. Mm -hmm. As these birds are calling for each other and, and, and trying to have these mating as- associations. Of course, alternatively, you can imagine a situation before the the mating group gets together where it's just a few. Oh, and that's doing the trying to yeah. get mates, which does go back to the story of two or three standing there by themselves trying to attract mates. Well, and one of the things I thought of, especially with seabirds, is... A lot of penguins uh, are dedicated parents. You yes. Know, male, female, both take care of the young. And the young stays with the parents for a while. That's three. That's true. <laughs> that's that's a trio. <laughs> and a lot of ocean-going animals that, like, travel, you know, maybe away from home for a long time as they go searching for food and everything, often have bonding rituals. Like albatross will do this when the one of them comes back from sea and has been gone for like three weeks or something. When they get back, the male and female do a song and dance and display to one another to reestablish their bond. Oh, uh, yeah. So the, uh, ours could be that, you know, dad or mom stays at stays back with mm-hmm. the, the, the newborn as the other one goes searching for food. And then when they come back. You could ev- you could you could even say that that song ritual upon return serves as both a bonding exercise mm-hmm. and territorial exactly yeah calls like hey now we're both here mm-hmm. everyone f- on this mile of island needs to know needs to back off that we are we are now here yeah I like that well the the reason I'm really enjoying all all of the things we're coming up with so far is it makes. It, it makes all of, like the fear that these human birds would be inflicting and potential danger of causing people to go, go too close to rocky shores incidental. Right. It's all like it's just these birds being birds and everyone else is getting real creeped out about it and yeah. telling scary stories about it. <laughs> or if you want to go a step further, you could say that there are other dangerous things on the islands. Yes. So people come near and then incidentally, like some of our sea serpents live yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. That's actually why it's a dangerous yeah, place. The sea serpents are there trying to hunt the sirens <laughs> and get a sailor. 
So if they are eating shellfish or or seeds, right? Yeah. They, 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 you could have a, an island uh, full of, of cool plant life uh, that can give them kind of the shorter mm-hmm. beak. That's something we've seen in tons of birds, right? They're the finches with the big beaks. Um, you could even have them be, I mean, they're birds. They could be very ornamented. Oh, yeah. And you could have feathers that along the head. Look that very hair-like. Look hair-like. So you could have this kind of, now I'm picturing a penguin with a hairdo. Yeah. Well, uh, it, and it, a short beak. It'd be kind of like the, the macaroni penguins that have the decorative feathers. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, just one that has a bit more plumage on the head. And yeah, the short beak, because the penguins don't have their beaks for hydrodynamics, particularly. It's to grab and catch fish. Right. But if I'm not grabbing and catching fish, then a short beak's no problem. Oh, sure. And these don't even have to be particularly good swimmers. No. If they're going for shellfish or if they're foraging mostly on or near the island, well, they don't have to be good swimmers, right? Good enough to, like, go Get across the little channel to yep. the next island if you have to. And if they're not... it. Not being super fast swimmers can also be part of why they got so big. Right. That takes you out of the prey options for smaller, faster predators. And now hopefully you can still outrun the bigger ones. Right. Yeah. So you, you have a... So we've we talked about this a lot on the podcast, but island gigantism. Yes. A form of insular evolution where you will have small animals evolve off sometimes larger sizes Either because there's not predatory pressure or because you are more more readily able to exploit the mm-hmm. resources on the island. We could even say that if there's a history of people coming to the island, there has been selection for larger sizes. Yes. So that you don't get picked off by people coming in. Yep. Uh, uh, trying to, to nab baby birds. Absolutely. So wrapping up sort of what we've got so far... We have a group of seabirds, yep. of some albatross-like or cormorant-like or gannet-like, that has either within a group that has already done this or convergently with penguins or mm-hmm. auks or something, evolved into a swimming slash land-dwelling large size. Yep. Yeah, maybe human size, maybe close to human yeah, I mean, size. It, even if it was just like four or five feet tall right that's close that's enough. at a distance that looks like a human island dwelling flightless flightless birds with short faces mm-hmm. right for cracking shells and seeds and such maybe some ornamental feathers probably forward facing eyes now that we're like if if they're going to have very human faces they may have true true it could be, now i'm thinking like an owl yeah Yep. Kind of face would be would be particularly good. Absolutely. That's kind of what I'm picturing. Is that I'm kind of picturing the owl from Avatar, the uh oh, the, in the library. Yep. Yeah, it's not it's a bad. Kind of yeah. that that very <laughs> straight up and down posture and very flat face and which have expanded upon the natural bird typical bird habit of being very vocal. Yep. With just these really extravagant mating songs. Mm -hmm. So in the vein of something like a lyrebird or kookaburra, these animals that create these extremely complex, extremely loud, audible sounds, and in the vein of lyrebird and parrots and such, is building them out of mimicry. Yes. Is copying the sounds that it hears. So when you're going past the island... Some And especially if they are split into territories mm-hmm. or if they're kind of, you know, you have parental care, maybe you have family groups mm-hmm. or different islands have different uh, uh, sort of generational histories, lineages. You might have different tendencies in different sections of the islands. Picture island, you know, Darwin's finches where mm-hmm. there's multiple different beak shapes. You might have multiple different subpopulations that have certain tendencies in their song well and you can also have uh different songs for different reasons you know oh, true. this is my territorial song this is my uh honey is home song this is the you know calling the the kids you know like the the or baby calling the parents mm-hmm. song you know that i'm i'm separated and i'm looking for mom and dad so those songs can be composed of bird noises other bird species yep. noises, sounds from the ocean. Yeah. So 
whale song. And, yeah, if there's a history of humans visiting, yep. then they have picked up the sounds of humans, possibly humans in distress during humans shipwrecks. In, humans singing. Like, I just got a picture of, like, you, oh, yeah. hearing sea sh- sh- you hearing sea shanties coming from the islands as the birds repeat the songs you've been singing on the ships. Yeah. Well, and it could also end up, we, we can kind of cheat a little bit uh, and, and f- factor in coincidence it could be that the sounds that are alluring to humans happen, some of them to have been selected for, mm-hmm. because they also work well for the birds. Yes. Like, maybe human singing, which happened on the island at some point for whatever reason, ended up being a great mating call. Yeah. Or a great territorial sound for some quality of that voice that is particularly enticing or particularly scary or whatever it is. Or a you know, like a siren, an mm-hmm. actual siren of a sinking ship, mm-hmm. or like of the bell or yeah. something. That is a noise that is loud and carries far. So it could easily be that the bird heard that sound and that particular frequency is oh no no this is great this echoes all over my territory yeah. everyone around's gonna hear it. So there may have been some selection for the birds to copy certain noises. Well, and it it also makes me think of birds that have quirks that we don't fully understand, where it's like bower birds, which are another bird of paradise that builds a bower, a big, like, display stage. Yeah, extravagant uh, nesting Yeah, they'll weave together arches and they'll decorate it with things they collect. And often individual, different male individual bower birds will have preferences for colors. Yes. This male's just, he, this is his red phase and this is this other one's blue period. And they are just, for some reason, this one's gone with yellow and there doesn't seem to be a rhyme or a reason to it. Or like how crows like shiny things and collect them. But I've never heard of like an evolutionary, you know, because they look like, you know, this thing's, no, they seem to be interested and grab it and steal it. Yeah, that's their personal preference. That's their personal preference. It could be like that with the sirens, where it's just like, for some reason, human voices really just are very appealing to the sirens. Yeah. And some of them like yelling, and some of them like singing, and others like the noise of shouting and stuff. Like, And it just happened that it worked really well as humans started interacting with them. Yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying this. I like this siren. This is yeah. it's a bit less monstery than some of our monsters. Well, and we could also give them I don't know how how many birds have resonating oh, yeah. functions, but there are birds that will have a yeah, pouch. The, um ostriches do that. They do mm-hmm. that that little booming. Um the cockapo does that as well. Uh, yeah. so yeah, there's a it few who do functions to accentuate a sound. Yeah, neck like, and chest resonating. Right. Well, like a, like a frog's pouch mm-hmm. helps mm-hmm amplify the sound and so you can have them being very loud oh yes absolutely and yeah they're they're less monstery they would look weird oh yeah and that's these would be super weird looking i like that these are monstery in the fact that they are going to inspire monster stories and ghost stories and yeah creepy tales for children that be careful of the bird women because they will they will get you when you're sailing just because they're creepy and unnerving and confusing yeah, and yeah I, I actually really like that. A- another thought I just had, if they are doing these mating displays, I believe there are birds that will, like, puff up their chest. Yes. A- yeah. As part of that display, which could easily be mistaken by passing sailors for yep. the-, the image of a woman on After an island somewhere. After a few months at sea, <laughs> some poofy feathers sure do look interesting. Yeah. Uh, no, I like that. And to... Bring them back to uh, to the monstery side of things a little bit. I wouldn't want to mess with these birds. Like these birds would still be plenty dangerous. Oh, yeah. if Have you, you ever to... been bitten by a parrot? Yep, <laughs> like, it's not pleasant. That's exactly what I was thinking. I haven't personally, but I know many a person who has. I've been bitten by parakeets. Yes. Yeah, and not fun. I've heard of people who've been bitten <laughs> by parrots, Ooh. and it's bad. And you know, to the degree that we want to expand their dietary habits. But a beak that can crack seeds and mm-hmm. can crack shells could also crack bone. And you will get animals that 
uh, are typically going for one type of food that will turn to other things. So, you know, bone interior is full of protein and stuff. And this happens on an island where your resources might be limited. There may be a benefit to a group of birds who every now and then be like, oh, well, hey, this carcass. this carcass washed up. Yeah, I'll crack some of those bones open. Well, it's it's basically all predators are opportunistic. There are very few predators out there that are like, no, 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 no. Only this. this. No, if there's food available, you take it because you don't know when you're going to get to get food again because yeah. it runs away from you every time. And so all it would take is one ship full of people to witness one group of sirens feeding on the bodies of a shipwrecked crew. Yeah. To then be like, that's th- that's that's what they do when they lure you in. Yep. Or even using bones in their nest. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Bringing. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. It's, well, because that that's that handy yep. sturdy material. Rocky island with maybe not a lot of trees for you to make stuff. So you're bringing in all sorts of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Or even Ooh. if it's not human bones. Like yeah. Yeah. A person coming up like. It's made out of fish bones, but a person looking real quick is going to go, look at that crazy bird yeah. woman building a nest out of human well, bones. Especially if we use other aquatic mammal bones, you know, yeah, if it's like seals. seals. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, as we've said, uh, our tradition has become almost accidentally to put the weirdest ones yep. at the end of each year. This was, I like these I sirens. Like, I, I like that it's just a macabre, you know. It's it's not actually evil. It's just off putting and creepy. Yeah, but to no fault of its own. No, which which I think is something that especially this season, this year's spooky, has been a bit of a trend here. Is that these are all creatures who who have stories about them. Yes, depicting them as monstrous. And what I like that we've been able to do this year is come up with biological reasons why they are acting in a way that people might interpret as scary or monstrous, Mm -hmm. but that are totally reasonable things. And most of them aren't even uh, predatory. Yeah, or openly aggressive. Right, they're not actually... Because early on we had some that were, no, no, this this might actually hunt people. And it might... No, a lot of this year it's just been, no, I'm just doing my thing, but I happen to look intimidating or I happen to be associated with scary things or i happen to be territorial and so it's it's fun to come up with these ideas for how you can have a realistic naturally evolved animal that comes off as scary Mm -hmm. without actually being evil or or nefarious absolutely which is really one of the cores of spooky and i like it for this year particularly because it really fits with that sea monster stories are stories by sailors typically. And it fits very well with the, as you've said, the, the fisherman's tale (laughs) of this. These are people stuck at sea for, you know, months at a time potentially. And so stories get shared and reshared and exaggerated. Right. That Leviathan is bigger every time he tells the story. And so I, I like that a lot of these animals really fit that well, that they are, odd mysterious creatures that do a couple of very creepy disturbing things that can then very easily be led into being monsters yes cool it, it, it gives our growing spooky verse once again we didn't come up with that but we will no, take it no it's yeah, but it's absolutely. happening we accept it it it, it is happening spooky verse is just this fat incredible fascinating mixture of story cultural historical lore and natural history yes kind of like the real world yeah you know but picking and choosing the most interesting examples of it absolutely well hey we got a pretty good lineup from this year i really like these i'm 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 happy with all of them this was a lot of fun this was this was a ton of fun we hope that everyone has enjoyed it and also hey if you're listening to this on the day it comes out Happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween. Thanks for joining us for our third season of Spooky. You can rest assured that in 11 months, Mm -hmm. we will return. With a new theme has yet to be decided. And more monsters to come. Also, as of this recording, we have started to see some fan art. And it's so amazing. So, once again, 
if you are inspired and if you happen to to do some artwork or something uh, related to what we're talking about, send it our way. We'd love to see people's interpretations of what we're coming up with because it, it, it brings it to life for us in Absolutely. a way that A, super fun, and B, we we are not going to do. No. And, and of course, we're not asking. We're begging. Please. It'd be so <laughs> cool. It's so, it makes me so happy. It makes us so happy. And with that, I think I think it is time to wrap up Spookulative Evolution for this year. Goodbye for now, and see you next October, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.